Hello, uh, rethinking Thesen. Uh, this is a reply to your video on, on Buddhism for the scientifically oriented. Um, I have to admit right on, this is not a straight reply. I'll es essentially talk about three itches that Buddhism has given me in the past. Um, as for what I mean when I say Buddhism, it's basically what you might call uh, mainstream Buddhism in the West. So basically Thich Nhat Hanh and Agent Brahm and Aya Kema, to some degree even Brad Warner and Stephen Batchelor, though they are a little bit different. Brenda Shoshana, of course. Um, you know, this line of, of thinking, I had a, an, an affair with Buddhism a while ago that lasted for a few years. I never really called myself a Buddhist. Um, I did uh, pretty formal, pretty regular Zen meditation for maybe two or three years. I'm still doing some kind of meditation, I guess, even today. Uh, it's just very informal, so I'm, I can't really tell whether one might call it meditation in the Buddhist sense or not. First one I'd like to talk about is karma. Um, there is a claim that's going around and I'm sure you heard it and I guess you I, I could imagine that you like it just as little as I do which is when people say karma is karma is just the law of cause and effect. Uh, it isn't. Um, I think what karma really is is a nice observation um, about the social inter interactions that humans have, about how human societies work, um, and a rule of thumb for how to behave in a society, society like that. And that's perfectly fine, of course. But it's not the same thing as the law of cause and effect. Mm, if I'm friendly, to my neighbors that have, has good repercussions because they are friendly to me and they are friendly uh, to other people as well, so that's a good thing. But, it's, first off, it's just a rule of thumb, it's not how it always works. Uh, and secondly, Buddhism makes this into a metaphysical law, a general principle, um, a law of the universe that extends at least to all sentient beings, probably even beyond that. Uh, it works across incarnations in some way, which to me, th that's where it starts to get a bit fishy, you know, uh, because you, you cannot possibly ever disprove that. I mean, it's, it's just unfalsifiable, right? And it binds us to the un an unenlightened state, to, to dualism and discursive thinking. And I mean, I think that's just severely overstretching it. You take an observation that works in one area and then you make it into a large speculation about the whole universe. Um, and then you phrase it in such a way that it becomes um, unfalsifiable. Uh, and you connect it to other parts of your uh, religion, ideology, whatever. So that, that's one thing. Second point is about enlightenment. Um, and specifically enlightenment as a goal. Now I know that a lot of Buddhist writers try to um, turn enlightenment into some kind of non-goal, okay? And, and I admit that this is fun to read, I enjoy that. Uh, it has this fun little Zen paradoxical nature to it, which I really enjoy. But I don't think that um, turning enlightenment into a non-goal actually works. I, I, I think um, all in all and in the mainstream Buddhism does set up the goal of enlightenment 
and Nirvana uh, beyond that. Um, and I think that setting up enlightenment as a goal is a huge, huge trap and very dangerous. Um, to me, after the death, death into Buddhism, I learned a lot about neurology, and my conclusion is that enlightenment uh, just is not possible, uh, or at the very least that there is no sign of enlightenment being possible. Uh, that yes, we can work on, on our own minds, we can spend more and more time in the quote unquote non dualistic right hemisphere, another, and so on, and so on. Uh, I do believe that this is a good idea for many people. It makes people generally makes people more peaceful, more calm, that's a good thing. But I don't believe that humans are made in such a way by evolution uh, that they can attain the goal of enlightenment, that they can, can stay in this zone for an extended period of time, nor do I think that they should. And I think that if you have enlightenment as the ultimate goal in mind, there will always be disappointment. And I think that is um, setting up an unattainable goal, and then making it seem as though um, not attaining that goal is wholly into the responsibility of the person, not the method, but the person, is a recipe for disaster. I believe that's the point where religions turn themselves readily into tools for manipulation and power. Because basically you undermine people's self-esteem and then tell them that it's their own fault. And that's, I'm not saying that Buddhists do that. I'm not saying that they want to do that. Of course not. But I think there is a subtle tendency for that. And I think that some political systems have uh, used this as a tool in the past and then it's basically unavoidable once you have uh, this un unattainable goal in a ideology, in an ideology, in a religion, it's unavoidable that it gets used this way. And that I think is a big problem that I have never seen addressed in any Buddhist uh, lecture or book. Um, to make it uh, more concrete, that is the point where you can say only monks can. Uh, achieve enlightenment. Only males can achieve enlightenment. Only the followers of my sect can achieve enlightenment and so on. Uh, to me personally, when I discovered that enlightenment just doesn't exist, it was a tremendous relief. Okay? What's missing in Buddhism is respect and love for the monkey mind. Um, I mean, just the, the fact that they always talk about monkey mind and the mindless chatter of the mind and so on and so forth shows you that there is an, an imbalance there, which I think should not be there, not at all. I love my daydreams, I love my fantasies, uh, I love my monkey mind. Third point about meditation. Meditation can be a tremendous uh, tool for good, no question about that. It helped me out of my major depression, it made me more calm, more thoughtful, maybe more em 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 empathic. I think it has many benefits, but every powerful tool has side effects and has downsides. And uh, when I was at the height, so to speak, of my of my Buddhist practice, I did lose some of my creative impulse. And more specifically, I did lose a huge part of my sexual desires. And maybe beforehand I would have told you that this is a good thing, that I really want to lose those desires, because uh, at some point they were obsessive. But in hindsight, I'm not really sure, because I really like them, you know? <laughs> uh, 
And I'm a person who likes to dabble in writing in my spare time. Not to worry, I'm not doing it in English. It's not my, my primary language. Obviously, you hear that. Um, but losing the urge to write and losing parts of the inspiration because I've lost parts of my monkey mind is to me not really a good thing. I don't think I've ever heard any Buddhist teacher talk about that. Now, to on a more abstract general level, I think it's interesting to see which kinds of teachings, which kinds of methods do talk and do know about the side effects, about the negative side effects of their methods and who doesn't. Western medicine is a good example. With every single pharmaceutical you get this nice little paper that tells you negative side effects. Um, we all know that when you eat a cheeseburger it really tastes good and everybody likes it, but it has negative side effects and makes it bad. With technological advances, uh, nuclear power, we all know that there are downsides. But when it comes to alternative medicine, like the so-called traditional Chinese medicine, oh, not so sure, not so sure. Um, several methods of meditation. Um, hmm. Advaita Vedanta, Eckhart Tolle. Have you ever heard Eckhart Tolle talk about downsides of being in non-duality? I don't think so. And it also applies, interestingly, it also applies to methods of psychotherapy. I don't think I've ever heard about Freud talking about negative effects of, of psychoanalysis or gestalt therapy, um, nonviolent com communication, or its exact opposite, NLP, which both of which I've studied rather extensively. They do not ever tell you that there might be a downside. And I found that specifically with uh, nonviolent communication, NLP, there are downsides. I think that there is a problem with setting up enlightenment as your ultimate goal and meditation along with good living as a as the primary method for attaining that. Because if you do do so, it becomes impossible to acknowledge that meditation might sometimes be a better idea. Okay. I don't have a punchline, I didn't write one down, sorry. This video simply ends here. Have a nice day.